couple of other announcements. Uh, first off, last night we celebrated with the wedding ceremony of Travis and Alice and Ricky. Uh, we lift them up um, into their new life together and, and rejoice with them as, as they are uh, uh, embracing each other uh, in, in, this, in this new marriage covenant together. And then also, uh, we did this a couple weeks ago. We, had, we celebrated Scouting Sunday here at the church. And um, uh, one of the things that we did not have the opportunity to do was to provide Girl Scout cookies for you. And so um, some of you may have noticed a table back there with Girl Scout cookies uh, from Gwen. And, and there Gwen is raising her hand. Uh, so please visit her table after church today if you are in need of Girl Scouts. She attends the, uh, one of our Girl Scout troops that meets here at the church. And if she does not have what you need, and I know the Girl Scout cookies are a need and not a want, um, she will bring those next week. I've been assured of that. So I uh, want to uh, uh, remind you of a couple of those announcements here. Well, a few years back, advice columnist Ann Landers challenged her readers to come up with the world's third biggest lie. So the first two lies are the check is in the mail and from, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. So what is the third biggest lie? So she challenged her, her readers to, to, to provide what is that number three. And so here's a sampling of what she came up with. Five pounds is nothing on a person of your height. <laughs> you made it yourself? I would have never guessed. You don't look a day over 40. Of course, I'll respect you in the morning. Dad, I need to move out of the dorm room into an apartment of my own so I can have some peace and quiet when I study. Hmm, I heard something like that. It's delicious, but I can't eat another bite. The new ownership won't affect you. The company will remain the same. Hmm. We've heard this a time or two. The puppy won't be any trouble, Mom. I promise I'll take care of it myself. <laughs> it wasn't a puppy. It was a, a, a hamster, a fish. And Your hair looks just fine. I've never said that. Put away the map. I know exactly how to get there. You don't need it in writing. You have my personal guarantee. <laughs> I know those sound a bit familiar. Maybe they're hitting a little bit too close to home. Numerous studies tell us that lying is one of our most common sins. In the book, The Day America Told the Truth, it says that 91%, 91% of those surveyed lie routinely about matters they consider trivial. Of those, 36% lie about important matters. 86% lie regularly to parents, 75% to friends, 73% to siblings, and 69% to spouses. Now you might be thinking to yourself, sins, more sins, didn't we just cover a whole gamut of them, seven deadly sins? But today, today is a lesson, lesson on temptation. We already illustrated it with our children. We're going to be hearing about it here very soon from Kim. It is the craftiest, one of the most subtle of all the sins. Crafty, because it is always before us, beckoning us to partake. And subtle, subtle because we can excuse just about any behavior. Take the desire for a dream job. I'll tell you about John. John grew up in North Bend, Nebraska. John spent his time growing up listening and watching and following the Huskers. He had this dream of one day walking on for good old UN of L and then earning that scholarship. He didn't end up in, in f football pads, but he had the next best thing. He got to walk the sidelines as a sportscaster, interviewing the Huskers and getting paid for it. He thought he lived out his dream. And then after a while, he went into personal finance, was enjoying his life, and then he heard about the covet, a coveted job. Oh, my goodness. It was too good to be true. The announcer for Nebraska football games, that position was open. And so he applied, and through his connections, he got the job. 
But the problem was, a few months before, he had criticized his future bosses over the firing of Bo Pelini. He put it on Facebook. He quickly deleted the post. He didn't tell it, say anything about it in the interview. As I've told my children, be careful what you put on the internet. You can't delete anything. It's out there. Well, someone found it. Harvey Perlman is a disgrace. Remember, this was the guy who extended Steve Peterson's contract only to fire him a few months later. When will he be held to account? It seemed innocent enough. He posted it many months before he applied for the job, but he deleted it, didn't tell about it. It was found out. And John Schutz is not the announcer for Nebraska football. As we're about to hear, temptation is one of the hardest sins to overcome. And as we learned with our children, not even Jesus is immune. So Kim, would you go ahead and read that story from the Gospels for us? Today's reading is from Luke 4, verses 1 through 13. Jesus returned from the Jordan, full of the Holy Spirit, and was led by the Spirit into the desert, where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. In all that time he ate nothing, so that he was hungry when it was over. The devil said to him, If you are God's son, Order this stone to turn into bread. But Jesus answered, The scripture says, Human beings cannot live on bread alone. Then the devil took him up and showed him in a second all the kingdoms of the world. I will give you all this power and all this wealth, the devil told him. It has all been handed over to me, and I can give it to anyone I choose. All this will be yours then if you worship me. Jesus answered, The scripture says, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and set him on the highest point of the temple. And he said to him, If you are God's son, throw yourself down from here. For the scripture says, God will order his angels to take good care of you. It also says they will hold you up with their hands so that not even your feet will be hurt on the stones. But Jesus answered, The scripture says, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil finished tempting Jesus in every way, he left him for a while. May God add his blessing to the reading of the word. Thank you, Kim. Temptation is everywhere. Last year, I looked down at my driver's license and realized that I had about 13 to 14 months to go to renew my driver's license. And I said to myself, I need to get my actual weight down to what my driver's license weight says. <laughs> I mean, why lie about something like that? In fact, I even contacted a member of the congregation here saying, can you alter my suits because pretty soon I'm going to get down to my driver's license weight. Well, today, it's six weeks from today, I am going to have a birthday and will have to renew my driver's license. And I can tell you I'm not going to make it. <laughs> my temptation is food. I love food. And last week I took our college students to Valentino's Buffet. And how can you go into that place and love food and not be tempted by all kinds of wonderful rich pasta and food? Oh, don't get me started. <laughs> because temptation is at the heart of our message. Our scripture that we shared is a familiar one even to the non-religious. And it is a fitting passage for the start of our sermon series on Amistad. And I've added that little corollary, preparing for Jesus. Let me give you a little background. The year is 1839. Slaves rebel against their captors on a ship called Amistad. And because these, these slaves do not they don't know how to sail, and they don't know how to speak English. In fact, many of them can't even speak to each other because they come from different areas of Africa. The boat kind of drifts into American shores, and it is there where it is picked up by the Coast Guard. And so they're arrested, and, and begins this kind of interesting legal battle because nobody quite knows what to do with them. 
I mean, they know, most of the people know that they're slaves, and so thus their property, who do they belong to? From right from the get-go, we have an economic question. Who does this cargo, they're not human beings, they're cargo, who do they belong to? Well, the, the, the owners of the boat know that they do not speak English. And so what they do is they talk about an interesting law that's on the books in 1839. At that time, it was illegal to participate in the slave trade, which means that if you were born in Africa and captured in Africa, you could not be a slave. The only way to be a slave is you had to be born somewhere in the Americas. The slave trade was abolished. And so these, the, the owners of the ship know that, and they say, no, these Africans, they were born in Cuba, in the Americas. It's legal. We own them. They're our property, and we want them back. Well, eventually, a translator was found. And they find out that these Africans are actually born in Africa. Another problem. Who's going to believe them? I mean, they're going to say anything to be sent back to Africa. And let alone if you were a freed African-American at that time, you had very, very little rights. That's why Amistad is a famous case in American history. That's why Steven Spielberg made a movie out of it. It's not easy. It's not a cut and dry case. Because what takes place is the very existence of the livelihood of the people. When you watch the movie, it becomes very evident this is all about slavery. As you might imagine, the entire economic system of the Americas is built around it. And even if you didn't participate directly into it, you were afraid that a civil war was going to break out. In fact, that gets mentioned in the movie as well. And if you're an abolitionist, you felt that, that slavery is wrong and should be abolished, during 1839, you were a crazy religious person. So just think, today if you don't believe in slavery and you're, and you're a religious person, you're just a crazy religious person now. But the issue becomes very apparent at this time. It is all about money. And what is on everyone's lips, but how else do we make a living? We think about it when it comes to our pocketbooks. When it comes to the possibility that we're going to lose money or lose a job, we get a little anxious. And then we don't think so much about those temptations that affect us. In fact, this is at the heart of all of the stories mentioned today in our gospel. Of all the temptations. They're easily dismissed because they're crafty and they're subtle. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk through each temptation. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Now that one's easy. Food. I mean, how can food be a temptation? Unless it's Valentino's buffet. <laughs> but food, I mean, it seems so natural. Well, let me tell you the story of Reynold III. Reynold III was a 14th century duke in the area which is what now is now known as Belgium. And he was a bit overweight. In fact, he had a Latin nickname that was uh, as crasis, which just means in Latin, fat. His younger brother, Edward, rebelled against him, wanted the throne, and so had him captured, didn't kill him, put him into a room in, New, in Newcast, at Newkirk Castle, and promised to his older brother that he could regain his freedom if he was just leave the room. Well, that doesn't seem so bad. It had windows at a normal-sized door. It wasn't even locked. In fact, the door wasn't even guarded. But here's the problem. Reynolds size. He couldn't fit through the door. He couldn't fit through the window. And Edward, well, he knew his brother. And so every day he would send his brother delicious, rich food. Now, instead of dieting his way out for freedom, old Reynold grew fatter. When Edward was accused of cruelty, he would just say, my brother is not a prisoner. He may leave when he so wills it. Reynold stayed in that room for 10 years. He was released when Edward was killed in a battle. But his health was so ruined that he died within a year. He became a prisoner of his own appetite. G. 
Jesus answered him, it is written, one does not live by bread alone. The temptation here is not food, it's self-control. After Jesus survives this test, he has one concerning power and economic might. If you then will worship me, it will all, referring all those kingdoms, it will all be yours. Right now we'll have, we'll have a video that comes from this movie. So, Justin, if you will show it to us, please. Temptation, as I talked about here, is of people's pocketbooks. This is not a cut and dry issue. And that's why this movie won an Academy Award. On the one side, it is that issue of these are human beings taken from someone from another continent against their will. As we see in the movie, this is an issue of righteousness. On the other side, played by Matthew McConaughey, the lawyer, they addresses the economic issue. He's talking about how people make a living. He knew the, the temptation of everyday people. He's a lawyer, by the way. And he knew the South, that they were dependent on slavery. Thousands upon thousands of acres in agricultural production. It simply was not cost productive to pay people to do the labor. That's how they make a living. And they've been doing it for hundreds of years. They could not see another alternative. It even affected the church. This economic structure kept people from compromising on slavery. And the Methodist church was not immune. In the north, they demanded that slavery be abolished. But in the south, the question was, how else do you make a living? So the, the church kind of had kind of a unique little compromise. They said nothing about slavery, nothing, but they did say this one thing. Pastors and bishops 
Bishops who are considered uh, leaders of the church cannot own a slave. Now this seemed fair, this seemed fair until, oh, whenever I hear a, a, a siren, just always think about those that uh, are in need of help. This seemed like a fair compromise until a bishop from Georgia inherited slaves from his wife. Now, it seemed pretty cut and dry. Okay, bishop, you cannot own slaves. Just go ahead and divest them. But here's the problem. In 1839, the U.S. had, a, had an interesting law that said that you could not free a slave. Interesting law. So the bishop had a quandary. Um, does he free the slaves and thus violate U.S. law? Or does he keep the slaves and violate church law? Well, the church comes together in 1840, one year after this case. They begin to debate the issue of slavery, and they agree to disagree. In four years, they're going to come back, and we're going to split the church between north and south. It's the only way we can agree to disagree on this issue. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. The temptation here is, Who do you serve? Luckily, Jesus passes test number two. And then he gets to the final test, which, as I told the children, is the hardest of them all. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. The temptation here is health, safety, and security. Think of all that we do to make sure that we are safe and secure. We make doctor's appointments. We listen to the doctors. We make sure that we have adequate health insurance. We make sure that we live in safe homes. We drive safe cars. We, we lock our doors because we want to feel safe and secure. But temptation is always lurking. In the autobiography of Martin Luther King Jr., King describes a turning point that occurred one night after he'd received another threatening phone call. He says, I got out of bed and began to walk the floor. I was ready to give up. In this state of exhaustion, when my courage had almost gone, I determined to take my problem to God. My head in my hands, I bowed over the kitchen table and prayed aloud. The words I spoke to God that midnight are still vivid in my memory. I prayed, I am here taking a stand for what I believe is right, but now I am afraid. The people are looking at me for leadership, and if I stand before them without strength and courage, they too will falter. I am at the, I'm at, I am at the end of my powers. I have nothing left. I've come to the point where I cannot fail it alone. At that moment, I experienced the presence of the divine as I had never before experienced him. It seemed as though I could hear the quiet assurance of an inner voice saying, Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for truth. God will be at your side forever. Almost at once, my fears begin to pass from me. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Temptation here is loyalty. It tempted King. It tempted our Messiah. Because who wouldn't want to feel safe and secure? That's why the power of God's righteousness needs to be with us. In fact, it is the trust of God's assurance that keeps each temptation at bay. As we prepare for the coming of the Messiah on Easter, we're going to learn about temptation as we did today about redemption, about a homecoming, and about the existence of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And hopefully we can learn that there are better ways to make a living.